our morning class is on the acid alkaline balance in the body. And we'll also be going to having a look at, uh, at arthritis because arthritis is a condition that thrives in a very acid environment. So what I want to begin with, I want to begin with showing you how the acid alkaline balance works in the body and it's important to understand that because when you understand how the acid alkaline balance works in the body then you begin to know how to work with the body to maintain that precision balance of acid alkaline. The body runs according to precision balance and we've looked at how the imbalance can cause problems, we looked at how the imbalance in um, in hormones can cause problems, the imbalance in salts, in waters, in so many areas. So before we begin, at the beginning of the day, we ask the greatest teacher that's ever walked the planet to teach us. Father in heaven, thank you so much for bringing us here. Thank you so much for this body and thank you so much for the simple principles that when we apply, we can see turnarounds and healings. Teach us, impress us, and give us understanding. This morning we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So let's begin. And what we're going to begin with is the, is the acid alkaline scale. The acid alkaline scale is called the pH scale. So why is it called the pH scale? Because when you dissolve acid in a solution, it gives off hydroxy, oh, sorry, hydrogen ions. And when you dissolve alkaline in a solution, it gives hydroxy ions. So pH means potential hydrogen or potential hydroxy. So that's what pH means. Up one end of the scale, we've got acid. And the reading on the acid end is naught. And up the other end, we've got alkaline. And the reading on the alkaline end is 14. And right in the middle, we've got neutral. Neutral means neither acid nor alkaline. And neutral's reading, so we've already got a naught. Neutral's reading is seven. And all water should be seven. But if it's been, uh, if it's been tampered with and it's got chlorine and fluoride in it, it will become more acid. But uh, good quality rainwater, uh, even sometimes you can get some great uh, well water, and I think a few people around here have well water. Um, it should sit at around seven. Blood has a reading on the pH scale, and blood's reading on the pH scale sits between 7.35 and 7.4. All blood will be within that scale or in that parameter. Because if blood pH goes up to 8, that person will go into a coma and die of alkalosis. And if blood pH drops down, to 7.22, that person will go into a coma and die of acidosis. So there can't be much variation there. And we don't have to worry about the pH of our blood because God designed the human body so that there are processes that are constantly keeping it within that range. And one is your lungs. And this explains why you, when you start climbing up a hill or exercising, your breathing changes. You start to breathe a lot deeper. What's happening is, as you start to move the body, you're burning more fuel, you're giving off some lactic acid, you're giving off some carbon dioxide, and when they get overloaded in the blood, it makes the blood a little acid, and so the brain says, quick, breathe, we need oxygen to alkalize, and we need you to breathe to get rid of that carbon dioxide to balance out the pH of the blood. The other organ is the kidneys. And the kidneys are constantly balancing the pH of the blood. And it's a fascinating way it does it. So let me show you. So here's our kidney, looks like this. And all on the edge of the kidney 
in fact, the average person has one million filtering units in one kidney, and your kidney's as big as your fist. So the little four-year-old, their kidney's as big as their fist. My six-foot-six brother-in-law, his kidney's as big as his fist. So your kidney's as big as your fist. So let me magnify the little filtering units. They look like this, and the waste comes out once the blood has been filtered and it weaves around these tubes, they're called tubules. And then down into the bladder, there's the bladder. And so these little tubules, basically they sit like this all through what's called the cortex or the inner part of the kidney, whereas the little filtering units, they're all on the edge. And then the filtrate goes into the ureter, down into the bladder, and then it's urinated out. In a 24-hour period, 1,800 litres of blood is filtered. Now, we don't have... Uh, so, for you, it would be quarts. So, 1,800 quarts of blood are filtered in a 24-hour period because every two minutes, 1.2 litres is being filtered. And out of that 1,800 quarts or litres of blood, 180 quarts or litres is, is filtered out. But we only urinate out 1.5 quarts or litres a day. So we've got a shortfall there of about 160 litres or quarts. What, where's that go? Aren't you glad we don't urinate out 180 quarts a day? Otherwise, we'd all be leaving every five minutes. <laughs> and we'd have to have 10 times the amount of bathrooms. No, we only urinate approximately 1.5 litres or 1.4 quarts. So where's the rest? There's a reabsorption here. And it's in the reabsorption area that the pH is being filtered. So the blood comes into the filtering unit, weaves around it where it's filtered, and then the blood weaves around the tubules. And every two minutes, 1.2 litres is going through these filtering units. Now, if the pH of the blood gets too acid, then extra acid is dropped into the tubules to be urinated out. But if the pH of the blood goes to alkaline, then extra acid is pulled back out of the tubules and back into the blood. So it is in that way that our kidneys are constantly monitoring the pH of the blood. Because as you can see, we, we, can't, we can't afford any changes there. <laughs> and yet this is constantly happening without us even realising it. What an amazing body we have. Psalm 139, verse 14, the Bible says, I will praise you, I'm fearfully, wonderfully made. Marvellous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. And yet, the psalmist that wrote that, he didn't even know the intricacies that I've been sharing with you this week. <laughs> Incredible body. So we don't have to worry about the pH of our blood because it's constantly being monitored either by your lungs, by the kidneys and keeping it within that range. There are a few other things that are monitored there, and I thought I'd mention them to you while we're, while we're in the tubules. This is where sodium and water levels are balanced. That's why you'll find if someone has compromised kidneys, their legs often swell. This is also where blood pressure is monitored. If someone has compromised kidneys, often they've got high blood pressure. It's not the only cause of high blood pressure, but it's a contributing factor. So let me tell you the story about a lady that came to our program. She came to our program and she was booked in on Sunday morning. Saturday night I get a call from this lady. She's in her late 50s. She said, I'm very concerned about coming to your retreat. I said, oh, why is that? She said, well, I'm about to go on dialysis. My blood pressure's up. My legs are swollen. Can you see why? kidneys aren't working well. She said, what if, it get, what if I get worse when I'm at your retreat? Do you have a doctor there? 
I said, no, we don't have a doctor. And if you ask my husband, he says, and we don't want one. <laughs> now, I'm not against doctors. Some of my best friends are doctors. It's the system. Yes. Isn't that right? Yes. It's the system. Because they're not taught that the body can heal itself. Right. No. Their, their role is to come in and do stuff to the body. Right. And I do acknowledge there are some times in a severe accident or in a severe situation, surgery may be necessary. And I think you'll agree with me, surgery's come a long way. There's no doubt about that. We're not talking about crisis. We're talking about day-to-day -day things. So this lady's concerned. She said, what if I go through the detox and I get worse? I said, well, we are one hour from the hospital and if at any point, if you're concerned, we can take you in. But I said, we'll keep an eye on you and we can adjust the program accordingly. All right, she said, I'll come. <laughs> Haven't had anyone ever say that. I found out later that, that her sister and her mother had paid for her to come. And she reluctantly came. <laughs> and when I consulted with her, this is about four or five years ago now, when I consulted with her, I saw a few things. She drinks two glasses of water a day. She drinks five cups of coffee a day. So that's putting a huge strain on the kidneys. That's actually producing incredibly acid urine, <laughs> which, the kid, which can hurt those delicate little nephrons. That's why the kindest thing you can do to your kidneys is keep well hydrated. She also had all the symptoms of a gluten intolerance. And because she was a nurse, she would just grab the fast food, grab the sandwiches, grab the pasta, grab the, grab the, the cereals, just the fast foods. And I know as a nurse, when someone's been carefully looked after and they, and they go home, they love to give the nurses that looked after them boxes of chocolates. <laughs> In nearly every nurse's station and every nurse that's here will nod their head. There's boxes of chocolates. So, yeah, the diet, the diet was not very good at all. I also saw that she had quite a major hormonal imbalance. So what I like to do is you work on what you see. See, if anyone's not well, this is the simple formula. Number one, you look at the history. And that will often explain why what's happening is happening. And then you look at symptoms. And when medicine treats symptoms, it masks the symptoms. Because what are the symptoms? The symptoms are this, excuse me, excuse me, can you attend to this? Isn't that what symptoms are? It's a voice from the body. And if you apply a poultice or you apply hot and cold compresses or you apply you know, herbs to the area and the symptoms relieve, what's the body just said to you? This, thank you, this is what I want. This is what I want. So when you treat symptoms naturally, and actually that's all you can do, that's, that's your guide. And what you're looking for now is response. Remember this word? And I'll just put it in great big letters. Listen! <laughs> when the body speaks, we've got to listen. Because if you don't listen to the first whisper, the body will start screaming at you. And when it starts screaming at you, it's doing damage. Remember that. This, her body had been screaming at her for a while, but you know, she didn't know what to do. And how many people don't know what to do? So she came to the retreat, she said, I will not be able to, I will not be able to walk with your guests. I said, that's right, because her legs were so swollen. But I said, what I'd like you to do is get on the rebounder for one minute every hour and just do this. That's all. Just do this. Call the health bounce. Everyone can do the health bounce, just, just that. And I said, as the legs come down, because I knew they would, I said, do a little bit of barefoot walking. That's why those kids yesterday said, is barefoot good? I said, it's very good. <laughs> <laughs> and it's perfectly fine here, you know. There's no drug addicts under the trees leaving their needles around, you know. 
um, just a little bit of barefoot walking, that you know, energy from the middle of the earth and also the massage of the feet on, the, on that soft grass. And early that morning, I'd prayed. I always pray for the guests. Father, what do I do? Because <laughs> he knows what I don't. This lady's about to go on dialysis. What do I do? And God impressed in my mind, your celery's going to seed. Celery is a very good kidney herb. And, and you get a concentration of your nutrients in the seed. My parsley was going to seed. So it must have been middle of summer, isn't that, when your parsley and your celery go to seed? Celery is an, celery is an excellent kidney herb, as is parsley. Parsley is another excellent kidney herb. And all through my lawn, and unfortunately all through my garden, there's cooch grass. It's a pest. I'm always pulling it out, but it's a very good kidney herb. So that morning I gathered up cast parsley seed. I just cut the tops, just cut the tops, grab some, grab some cooch grass, put it in a, in a we, we get old coffee percolators because I like making my herbs in glass. It's like a Pyrex glass. Brought it to the boil, put some grated ginger in so it'd taste a bit better. And I got it to drink a litre of that a day and a litre of water a day. Now that's, that comes to the eight glasses. But I said you're never to drink more than a few mouthfuls at a time because you've got to go gentle on those kidneys. She was on a salt-free diet too, by the way. And I said, I want you to have the smallest, maybe half a sesame side, size of the Celtic salt before every, every drink that you take. Within 48 hours, her legs had gone down 80%. Wow. She was astonished. She couldn't believe it. So what's, what's her response telling you? Thank you. Thank you. We're starting to give the body what it needs. She's starting to become hydrated. How many people with swollen legs say, I'm not going to drink any more water. Look, I've got too much. But the problem is the water's sitting outside the cell. We need to get we need to move it. So this lady went home, a very happy lady. By the third day, she's walking with the guests, yeah? I'm sorry, um, uh, I've never heard of an app for... Cooch grass, yeah, sorry. There probably is. What do we do today? Uh, Google it. <laughs> sorry, I, I, um, I was in Germany and they found one name for it. But you know, it's a feathery grass. It makes a beautiful lawn, but oh, it is a pest in your garden. Does it only grow in like Australia? No, I think it, I'll have a look around and see if I can see some. Does it stick to your body? No, no. It's like a feathery one that spreads. And the roots just get, spread right under the ground. But it makes a very nice soft lawn. A lot of people like it for lawn. Anyway, if you don't have that, even just celery and, and parsley are great. Yeah, yeah. She emailed me three months later. She said, I don't have to go on dialysis. Ah. No. She said, I don't have to go on dialysis. She said, I've gone back to full-time work. She said, I've lost weight. She said, I, I thought I was going to have to retire. How nice. What an incredible body we serve in. I mean, live in. Three, three months later, we had a guy come who was about to go on dialysis, so we knew just what to do. <laughs> do you know that's how you'll learn? My biggest learning curve is the people I meet and watch. What am I watching, constantly watching? What does your body say? What does your body say? See, from a young age, what have we been taught? We've been taught to go and give our health over to the doctor. A lot of people are frustrated with that, so now they're coming and giving their health over to the naturopath. They've gone from the chemical pill to the herbal pill. No, no, no drug will, ki will, will cure you and no herb will cure you. It's the body and the body alone. That's the only thing that has the ability to heal you. 
and that's why you must do this. Listen. Listen. Because as your body responds, that's your guide on what path to take. So this man that came three months later, we did the same thing. We made the tea. It wasn't summer anymore. The celery and the pasta weren't going to see it anymore. But by then, my offsider Amelia, she was so excited at the response. She'd, she'd ordered celery seed, she'd ordered parsley seed, and, and we were able to make the teas. And he, well, when, when you leave our retreat, you can go to somewhere like Trader Joe's and you can have a look. Ah, oh, kidney herbs. Let's have a look and see what this tablet, this kidney tablet's got in it. And you'll often find a concentration of those herbs that you need. So people live in the city. I live in the country. That's why I love being here because this is almost like home. <laughs> but when I'm in, you know, a lot of people come from the city and, you know, Trader Joe's, Whole Foods Sprouts, I think places like that, that's where you buy herbs and things, you can often get tablets that have all of those herbs in it. And he emailed us six weeks later, he said, I don't have to go on dialysis. How exciting. Can you come off dialysis if you're on dialysis? I don't know. But a lady who was working in India, doing a health retreat in India, she's from Fiji, she said, we had a guy coming and he was on dialysis and he came in one day and he said, I'm just not gonna do it anymore. I'm just not gonna do it anymore. I'm done. Anyway, he survived. But if you're not gonna do it, you must do alternatives. You must give the body the right conditions. But many people don't know those conditions. And so the, the kidneys, they're not only filtering your blood, your kidneys are also monitoring your acid alkaline balances in the body. Your kidneys are also helping to balance your blood pressure, helping to balance your sodium and your water levels in your body. The pH of the blood cannot change as we have seen, but the pH of the cell can. So the pH of the cell should sit at approximately 6.5. Now this is very slightly acid and there's a reason for that. The most acidic substance is sulfuric acid and on the scale of speed, sulfuric acid travels at the speed of light. And the most alkaline mineral, okay, I'm starting to ask you questions. I've already written it. Calcium, calcium is the most alkaline mineral. And it travel, and this one travels at the speed of light. On the scale of speed, that doesn't even move. And that's why the hydroponic garden is constantly testing the pH of the water that the roots of the plants sit in. Because if the water goes to acid, the roots burn. And if the water goes to alkaline, they don't get the speed of uptake of minerals out of the water and into the plant. So you see, it's a, it's a speed thing. And little chemical reactions are happening all through our body as we stand and we sit here. And so the pH in the cellular level is, is important, as you will see. If you've ever had a swimming pool, you have to test the water every morning because if the water goes to acid, the pipes corrode. If the water goes to alkaline, algae grows on the pipes. So just as this balance is important for the, in the swimming pool, for the hydroponic gardener, so too with our body. The gardener aims for a soil pH of 6.4. Isn't that interesting that the soil and the cell are very similar? It is true that different vegetables grow in slightly different pHs, but on an average it's about 6.4. The Bible says in Genesis 3.19, we come from dust, we go back to dust, we're dust precious dust. And in Psalm 103, the psalmist says, he remembers our frame. He knows that we are dust. <laughs> Very precious dust. Disease grows. It thrives in a cellular pH of 5.5. It is in a cellular pH of 5.5 where cancer thrives. It is in a cellular pH of 5.5 where fungus thrives. So basically you could say it's in a cellular pH of 5.5 where disease thrives. 
there's only the drop of one point. But this drop of one point means 60% less oxygen available at the cellular level. Cancer cannot live in the presence of oxygen. Oxygen is the most vital element needed for life. And remember, when, we, when our cells have adequate oxygen, it's giving us 18 times more energy. Where does Coca-Cola sit? You can put uh, Pepsi, uh, Dr. Pepper all here, 2.6. It's a killer. And this might surprise you, but some people drink it. It's true. I've seen it. They don't know. They don't realise. And you look at the advertising campaign around uh, Coca-Cola and Pepsi. It's the most incredible campaign, isn't it? The most beautiful models. <laughs> and what's, what's the message when they're so happy? The message is, if you want to look this good and be this happy, drink this. That's the sublingual message. But it is far from true. And you know why the advertising campaign is so massive? Because that's all they've got. They've got nothing else. <laughs> and you'll see why it is so acid. I'm going to step sideways for a minute and go through the basic sustain me principles and I want to show you how adhering to the sustain me principles it, it contributes to an alkaline environment and I want to tell you about some of my family and friends they don't go out in the sunshine at all because they think it's going to give them skin cancer but as we looked at yesterday, lack of vitamin D is a contributing factor to skin cancer. They don't drink water because they haven't got time to drink water and they much prefer to drink their coffee. When a person's dehydrated, that creates an acid environment. They go to bed too late, and I'm sure everyone endeavoured to go to bed a little earlier last night. They go to bed too late and they're not getting enough sleep, that creates an acid environment. They're stressed all the time. They've forgotten that they have a heavenly father who loves them, who even knows how many hairs are on their head. <laughs> the Bible says that he knows when a sparrow falls and how much more important are we. So they've forgotten all that. So they're stressed out the whole time. And it probably doesn't surprise you that stress, anxiety, worry create an acid environment in the body. Abstain. As we will see, the teas, the coffees, the alcohols, the cigarettes, they all create a very acid environment. I'll show you that. Inhale. We should be inhaling through our nose. Breathing in and out through the mouth contributes to an acid environment because the, because the nose can, it's the only one that can balance blood gases. It's the only one that can humidify, purify the air. So breathing in through the mouth can contribute to an acid environment. Nutrition, I'm going to define nutrition in a minute, but it probably doesn't surprise you that that carbohydrate list that I wrote, <laughs> acid environment. Moderation. Hunger is the strongest urge in the human body and when people are nibbling all day long and they huge appetite at night. And then they eat their largest meal and how many people have said, I just can't stop eating, <laughs> just can't stop eating. Overdo it, overburden the stomach. Too much exercise and not enough exercise both create an acid environment. So breaking all of those laws creates an acid environment. And the lungs and the kidneys are struggling, but they're just managing to keep the pH of the blood within that range. And then, oh no, the person has a can of Coke, a cup of coffee, and the scales are tipped. Blood pH starts to drop, 7.35, 34, 33, alarm bells go off. 
The last resort buffer system is called on. The most alkaline mineral is pulled out of its biggest storage house. What's that and where's that? That's the calcium and that's from the bones. Comes into the blood, immediately alkalizes the dropping acidity, 7.33, 34, 35, whew, we're safe, but at a cost. Now we've got this free calcium excess floating through the blood. What's the, what's the body going to do with that? Oh, it'll dump it in the kidneys as kidney stones, in the gallbladder as gallstones. On the bones as bone spurs. Even helping to build up that bunion. Contributing to the build up on the arteries, in the eyes, cataracts, we've heard of all this. They're all illustrations of Newton's third law of motion. To every action there's an equal and an opposite reaction. And in an old book I read this and it's quoted in my book. This law never ceases to act as nature's equaliser, setting in motion compensatory forces to remedy every imbalance. Isn't that the true cause of disease? Mm-hmm. So let's have a look at how we can keep that balance. As I just showed you, keeping those laws allows the body to maintain that balance. But what has the most effect probably is the food we eat. So we're going to have a look at foods that have an acid effect and foods that have an alkaline effect. The most alkaline forming food that you can take into your body is the humble lemon. But isn't the lemon acid? Yes, and it's acid where it should be. Okay, students, what's the only part of our body that should be acid? Stomach. Stomach. So it's a great digestive aid. And also a squeeze of lemon in your warm water in the morning, a great liver tonic. Remember we looked at the liver, how the lemon is a liver tonic? So all the salad dressings we serve uh, have lemon in them. So when you put that, that dressing on your salad, you're actually helping digestion. But, sorry, listen, I have to take you away. But I'm sure no one will forget, listen. But when the lemon is broken down in the gastrointestinal tract, and the minerals are separated and come into the tissues, they have an alkaline effect. Because the minerals in the lemon are alkaline minerals. That's sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, and iron. These are the alkaline forming minerals. So the lemon is acid where it should be and alkaline where it should be. Dark green, we've heard this one before. Dark green leafy vegetables are very high in these alkaline minerals. Dark green leafy vegetables are very alkalizing and they're alkalizing because they're high in the alkaline minerals. So we should eat dark green leafy vegetables every day. That's where my children were the hungriest and they all came to sit at the table. What was on the table? A big salad. <laughs> and when I first married Michael, uh, nearly 26 years ago now, his, he was used to the carb diet because he was a single father and the only thing he can really cook is toast. <laughs> so it was just fast food the whole time, meaning pasta and cereals, lots of bread. So I knew I had to ease into this new family. And his son was uh, 13 and his daughter was 11. And she was actually carrying a little bit of excess weight for an 11 year old. And I knew it was the uh, high carb diet. So at breakfast time, the first thing on the table was a big fruit salad and delicious uh, nut creams and seeds. 
and you could see Michael and his two children would sit down and look at the table. <laughs> and I would smile sweetly and Michael said, is there anything else? I said, yes, the hot is nearly ready. And when I notice that half the fruit salad has gone, I bring out the hot porridge or the apple bake or the muffins or whatever I've made for breakfast. Oh, maybe it was toast and avocado. Because I know <laughs> that if that was on the table first, then the fruit salad would get a bit of a look at. <laughs> then at lunchtime, I did the same thing. First thing on the table was big salad and delicious dressings and Michael would sit down and his children and they would look at the table. To my kids it was just usual. And Michael would say, where are the potatoes? I'd say, nearly ready. Now Michael does not like potatoes that are not ready. <laughs> and he, he does not like potatoes unless they're very hot. So he accepted that. And he said, lentils? Oh, nearly ready. <laughs> And we'd sit to eat, and when that salad was half gone, I'd say, oh, the potatoes are ready. The lentils are ready. Oh, and so is the bread. He told me years later he never realised what I was doing. <laughs> but encouraging the family to eat more of the raw, more of the dark green leafy vegetables. And I've often said to adults, whether they be aunts or uncles or grandparents or parents, you'll be surprised what children will eat when they're hungry. Yes. Take them on a picnic and forget the picnic. <laughs> Wear them out with the climbs and then, or take them on a picnic and what's the picnic? <laughs> what you want them to eat. And remember, you smile the whole time. I don't want to eat that. Oh, that's perfectly fine. You don't have to eat. But they're hungry. Also vegetables, vegetables have an alkaline effect. When I left Australia in 2021, and it was a miracle I even got on the plane, 30 people on a 300 seat fight. And when I got off the plane, they handled me like I had the plague. And then I realized I was the only non-vaccinated person on the plane. <laughs> and they, well, and then they put me in solitary confinement. <laughs> I thought it had been outlawed, but they put me in a hotel room and I could not leave that hotel room for two weeks. Now, when I left, when I left uh, the US, a lady gave me a book. It was called The Plant Paradox. I don't know if you've heard of this book, The Plant Paradox by Dr. Stephen Gundry. So he's basically saying vegetables are no good. Plants aren't really good. Anyway, out of probably politeness, I took the book. And when I got into my motel room, and I'm in a hotel room for two weeks, and I learnt that I could run from the balcony to the front door in about 15 seconds. I was able to do a very minor <laughs> high intensity. But I opened the book and I started to read it and I got very annoyed at this book because he says our taste buds developed over 10 million years and our stomach developed over 20 million years. Maybe I've got it a bit wrong, but something like that. And something happening in plants, oh, so I shut the book, but you know, I'm there for two weeks and, I'm, and I know that God arranged this because I don't think I would have read the book. So I read the whole book and I'm so glad I did because as I read it, I could start to see why he is saying that, but I wanted to know, well, what's God's plan? Because in the Garden of Eden, what did Adam and Eve eat? Plants. <laughs> you see, there was no death in the Garden of Eden and there has to be a death to, to eat meat. And as I read it, I started to see. I started to see why he was saying what he was saying. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to give you the truth on lectins. So lectins are... Oh, that was a good catch. So lectins are in foods and lectins are high in high amounts in raw fruits. 
than vegetables. But when they ripen, the lectin's gone. So I can see why God did that. He wanted to deter us from eating unripe fruit. <laughs> it's hard to digest and it has this bitter taste. But when it's ripened, it's delicious, isn't it? This morning I ate some organic strawberries from a local farm. Oh, the flavour melt in your mouth. But what's it like when you eat a, a green strawberry? So you can see, and, it, and it's the same with the birds. The birds don't start pecking the tomatoes till they're red. Isn't that true? It seems like the birds know more than us. So I understood, I understand that. It's a deterrent against eating the unripe fruit. Now if you do eat unripe fruit and the lectins get into your blood, they increase inflammation. But if you've got strong gut flora, that will disarm the lectins. Isn't that good news? That's why it's important to have cultured foods as part of our, our food. So this is your sauerkraut, yogurts, kefirs, things like that. What, what um, Stephen Gundry claims is we should not eat beans, if you heard that, legumes, because they're high in lectins. So I investigated a little bit more. And you know when you read the fine print, you, le you learn a lot, is that right? Right at the end of the chapter, right at the end he says, but if it's well soaked and pressure cooked and rinsed well, uh, the lectins are gone. But th that's, not, that's not right up the front. What's he saying? You shouldn't be eating beans. And this brings us back to Sally Fallon's book, Nourishing Traditions. It's a book about nourishing the traditional way of cooking food. And the traditional way of cooking food disarms the lectins. That's why people used to have um, fuel stoves. I had a fuel stove for 12 years. I love fuel stoves, the wood stoves. And I could put my beans right on the back corner and they'd slowly pop away. And when the water's looking a bit inky, I'd rinse them. And now I discover the lectins are in that inky water. And you know what I'd also do when I rinse them? I'd look at my saucepan, it's got this grey scum around the edge, so I wash the saucepan. What am I washing away? I'm washing away the lectins. So if the beans are properly prepared, the person doesn't have wind, is that right? Yeah. And they're not having the lectins. So it can, and pressure cooking kills the lectins. A lot of people have Instapots now, and the beauty of the Instapot is they can be a pressure cooker or they can be a slow cooker. Oats are very high in lectins, but the Scottish would soak them all day and put them on the fuel stove in the corner all night. That disarms the lectins. So I found this fascinating. I'm so glad I read it because I can tell you that plants are great. You've just got to prepare them properly. Gluten is a lectin. And in your traditional, well, let me show you what happened with the wheat. So the original wheat that God made is called inkhorn or einkorn, some call it inkenhorn, and the protein or the gluten structure, that is the lectin and it was very, very fragile in the original wheat. Fragile means easy to break down, very easy to break down, not a problem. And it is estimated a few thousand years ago that Enkhorn wheat did a wild hybrid with a field grass and came up with the Emma strain of wheat. And the Emma strain of wheat is not quite as fragile, protein or gluten structure, but still reasonably. And then it was the Emma wheat that was put through intensive crossbreeding in the 50s, 60s, to produce the hybridised wheat of today. The hybridisation of that wheat created an incredibly complex protein or gluten or lectin structure. Here it is. Whew. <laughs> no wonder so many people have gluten intolerance because it's a structure very hard to break down. But if you make that hybridised wheat into a sourdough bread, now we're getting back to what Sally Fallon talked about, the traditional way of baking bread, which was always the sourdough method. 
It's a cultured bread. So what that bread does is it breaks down the protein or the gluten in the grain and so we're left with a much more fragile structure. But still, as you can see, a little bit more complex than the original. Spelt. Spelt is a wild hybrid of the emigrain. So spelt has retained that fairly fragile structure and if you make spelt flour into a sourdough bread, it'll bring that fairly fragile structure back to the original very fragile structure of the Engelhorn. Spelt is a wild hybrid of the Emma wheat. So it's a natural wild hybrid. They crossed with a field grass and that produced the spelt grain. And that spelt grain has retained that fairly fragile structure. But if that spelt flour is made into a sourdough bread, that, cult that culturing process breaks down the protein or the gluten in the grain and brings it back even more fragile. And so sourdough bread retains or has attained to that very fragile structure of gluten or protein or lectin. So the sourdough process disarms the lectin. Again, getting back to the traditional way of preparing food. Uh, not easy, but you can get it. The process takes a couple of days, but you're not making bread for a couple of days. You'll, you'll work with it, then you'll let it sit. And then you'll work with it in another period of time and let it sit. But the uh, Misty Mountain USA, is my daughter's website and she can send you our original sourdough starter. Oh. She freeze dries it so oh. you can revive it. Yeah. Yep. The best bread I've tasted was in Germany. Oh, they have nice bread. Even in a hotel, they've got all the junk white and the and the brown that's really just white that's been coloured, then they've got the beautiful sourdough. And they do a lot of spelt. And they've done spelt for hundreds of years. So spelt is quite common in Europe. So they do a lot of spelt and they do a lot of rye. The rye hasn't got be, has not been hybridised like, like the wheat has. So that's the lectin story. But there's a little bit more. There's a food group called the nightshades. And the nightshade group of vegetables is high in lectins. What are the nightshades? Tomato and uh, bell pepper and also eggplant or some call it aubergine. In Australia and also in England they call bell pepper capsicum, probably heard that, and potato. And I'm, this, I'm not referring to the sweet potato, this is the, this is the white potato. In Fiji they call it the white man's potato, or it's the Irish potato. So let's go to Sally Fallon again and look at the traditional way of preparing this food. Traditionally, the Europeans always de-seeded and de-skinned their tomatoes and their bell peppers. And guess what's taken away when they de-seed and they de-skin? Lactins. <laughs> Interesting. So getting back to the traditional way of preparing food. And when someone has arthritis or gout, it's an inflammatory condition and they do well to ease right off the lectins. My mother died at 51, a cripple in a wheelchair with rheumatoid arthritis. Her hands were, were like this. She was quite deformed when she died. And I have strong inherited genes towards rheumatoid arthritis. And my body says to me, I can have a little tomato now and then. My body says to me, don't even think about putting bell pepper anywhere even near your mouth. <laughs> what happens when I do? It repeats on me all afternoon. And I listen. 
I look at my body's response and you know what I say to my body? I'm hearing you. I'm hearing you. I had a salad one day to function and I saw little bits of red and it looked like tomato. And as soon as it was in my mouth, I knew it. <laughs> so I just get the napkin and <clears throat> take it away because I know that my body does not like it. So I just listen. One lady who had arthritis said, but I love that food. I said, how much do you love your arthritis? <laughs> it's not forever. One lady stopped all those foods and she found that once she'd conquered her arthritis, did you hear that? Once she'd conquered her arthritis, she could have half a tomato three days a week. She could have a little potato most days. See what you do, you listen. She said, if I have it every day, my body starts to protest. <laughs> I start to get a few aches. And you know what she says? I'm hearing you. I'll back off. Listen. You have to listen. Because no two people are the same. And if I had 10 professors of nutrition in front of me saying, this is ridiculous, Barbara. That bell pepper is high in antioxidants. It's high in vitamin C. You should be eating it. Who do I listen to? Yeah? Yeah? That's why your highest authority is the body that you live in, because it will tell you. And things can change as your body starts to get stronger, as your body starts to conquer the illnesses, you might find you can do some little things that you couldn't do before. It's like our, our cook, Zach, Zach's Fijian. He was 19 when he was our cook. He's a very good cook. And I could tell if he ate wheat because he'd be yawning all day long. And he'd be forgetting everything. I say, Zach, my 50-year-old friends blame the fact that they're 50 for getting things. What do you blame? <laughs> he'd go, mm. I said, are you eating wheat? And he'd go, mm. <laughs> I could tell if he was eating wheat because he'd be tired and yawning all day long. So he made a, made a decision to stop. And we had a sparky, vibrant cook. His sister, if she ate wheat, she got covered in eczema. She couldn't touch it because of the eczema. You can have different family members that have allergies and they can all be responding in different ways. I, had a, I did a function where I was lecturing on health and he was cooking. This is a couple of years after what I just told you, which was about four or five years ago now. And we sat down to eat and he had a slice of bread. I said, hmm, can you eat that? He said, I can today, but not tomorrow and not the next day and not the next day. <laughs> he was only 21 and he'd worked it out. He conquered it and then he found that he could have a little bit now and then, but he couldn't have it every day because if he had it every day, he's back to yawning all day. It's like the, the live blood analysis that I did. I used to do at Misty. And I could tell if someone had an allergy because their eosinophils, which are a white blood cell that's present when there's an allergy, and they light up in the blood slide. And you should have about two in the whole blood slide. And this girl, she had 20 eosinophils. And I went, whoa. That's a lot of eosinophils. I said, uh, you must have an allergy to dairy and wheat. She said, I do, I do. Every time I eat it, I get diarrhea, I get rashes, but I like it. <laughs> That's why it was in her blood. I looked at her husband's blood. They're both mid-30s. I looked in her husband's blood and, and he had the same. He said, this is ridiculous. He said, I don't have rashes. I don't get diarrhea. And she looked at him and she said, yeah, but you fall asleep in the restaurant. He's 35 and he's falling asleep in the restaurant. So an illustration to show that different people respond in different ways. And so you listen. But it's good to know the foods that are high in lectins, that if you have any inflammatory problem, you ease off them and to build up that gut flora. So that's the story of lectins. It's actually far simpler than the whole book shows. <laughs> and I'm so glad I read that book before my new book, Sustain Me, is coming out because I was able to put that in. 
I was able to put that information in the new book. So vegetables have a question mark because the nightshade family has a question mark, especially if someone has an inflammatory situation happening in their body. When you cook tomato with an oil, and I think olive oil and tomato go very nice together, something's released that's not available in the raw tomato and it's not even available in the cooked tomato unless it's cooked with some oil. Lycopene's released and lycopene is a potent antioxidant that can reduce the inflammation of the prostate gland. So every guy over the age of 40 should be having a cooked tomato and olive oil dish three times a week. The Italians and the Lebanese knew what they were doing those beautiful rich tomato sauces. Unfortunately, because of the, the fat phobia that's overtaken the planet, but I think it's starting to clear. <laughs> I think it's starting to clear. The, the, uh, the oil is actually important. And lycopene is a derivative from vitamin A, and vitamin A is a fat-soluble vitamin. In other words, we need to be eating some oils with our foods to access our fat-soluble vitamins. Fruit has a question mark. So why does fruit have a question mark? Vegetables are high in fiber, high in minerals, and low in sugars. Whereas vegetables are high in fiber, high in minerals, low in, in uh, sweet, low in glucose. And so your best food, if someone has cancer or yeast, things like that, is vegetables. But if a person has a yeast presence in their body and they're eating a lot of fruit, that glucose in the fruit, it feeds the yeast. And as the yeast feeds on the sugar in the fruit, it gives off acetic acid. It gives off lactic acid. It gives off uric acid. And it also gives off alcohol. So can you see that the the glucose in the fruit is just feeding the yeast and the yeast is feathering its nest. It's creating a very acid environment that the yeast thrives in, this 5.5 environment. And that's why when someone comes to us for help with cancer, we suggest stopping fruit for six weeks. It's designed to give a sledgehammer effect to cancer cells because cancer cells consume 15 times the glucose of any other cell. It's not forever, it's just initially. And on our first day, we looked at the link between cancer and fungus. My book, Self Healed by Design, it has programs in there, programs that you can implement to get those glucose levels right down. When alcohol breaks down in the liver, it gives off a substance called acetaldehyde. And acetaldehyde, dehyde. acetaldehyde is a neurotoxin. What's a neurotoxin? It's a brain poison. And this is why most alcoholics suffer from alcohol-related brain damage. And alcohol-related brain damage um, can be seen just in areas of sorting, in areas of memory, in areas of foresight. It's a very real problem, but it's not often picked up, especially when the businessman's having alcohol at lunch every day because he's got such an efficient secretary, such an efficient wife. But alcohol is a neurotoxin, and one of the ways it kills the brain cells is the liver breaks it down to acetaldehyde, and that's what kills the brain cells. There are five places we can be exposed to acetaldehyde. One is alcohol. Another is a person with a yeast presence in their body eating a lot of fruit, a lot of sugars. The yeast prefers the sugar, but if you're not going to give it sugar, it'll happily consume all your sugar from your fruit. Also, vinegar. Vinegar is one stage before alcohol. It is acetaldehyde. Now the reason why people eat vinegar and don't get brain damage is because they eat such a little bit usually. <laughs> Just maybe a little bit on their salad. But it is. 
car fumes also give off acetaldehyde and cigarette smoke gives off acetaldehyde. So we want to keep away from the neurotoxins because the brain cells we have now, they're the ones we've got for life. If you want to investigate that a little bit more, you can Google Dr. Robert Young and vinegar or Dr. Robert Young and acetaldehyde. He's done a very interesting paper on it. Don't, don't, don't listen to all the media about him that claim that he's a threat to public safety and all of that. Um, usually if they say that about someone, it means they're, they're pretty good, they're on track. So continuing looking at some grains, there are two grains that are lectin free and that's sorghum and millet. Sorghum's only ever been grown in Australia for the cows, but they discovered that it's a gluten free grain and recently they discovered it's a lectin-free grain. So you can get sorghum flour now. And it's, remember, it's a gluten-free flour, it's an alkaline flour, and it's lectin-free. And millet makes a delicious breakfast. You've just got to remember to put four cups of water to one cup of grain. And it can be put in the slow cooker overnight. It's a great alternative to an oat breakfast. Also, Quinoa. quinoa does contain lectins, but if you rinse and rinse and rinse and rinse before you cook, most people realise that if you just cook quinoa, it's very bitter. But if you rinse even six or seven times, rinse before you cook, it doesn't have that bitterness because you've rinsed away most of the lectins. But it's becoming popular because it's a gluten-free grain and it's an alkaline grain. Buckwheat as an alternative to uh, granola, again trying to master saying one thing and writing another, buckwheat. As an alternative to oat granola at our health centre, we do buckwheat. We soak the buckwheat for a few hours, rinse it very well, then dehydrate it. And it becomes really crunchy. And we make it like a granola with that. Also spelt. Those are unaltered ancient grains, they're called. <coughs> also, there are a few legumes that are alkaline, soy, lentil. And we talked about soy when we talked about hormones, and soy is great as long as it's non-GMO and organically grown. And lima beans. They are the three alkaline beans or legumes. There are two alkaline nuts, almond and Brazil. Almond and Brazil are the alkaline nuts. We had a little chat before we started this morning about the thyroid gland and how the thyroid gland needs selenium to convert iodine into thyroxine. And Brazil nuts are the highest source of any food in selenium. Only five Brazil nuts a day are needed to get all the selenium that you need for a day. Brazils are also the alkaline nut. Almond is an alkaline nut. Almond is called the king of nuts because it's alkaline, it is high in, in uh, protein and also high in iron. Also the Seeds, all your seeds sit on the alkaline side. So we'll go over to the acid forming side now. And these foods are high in the acid minerals, which are phosphorus, sulfur, and chlorine. Yesterday we looked at how when meat breaks down, it breaks down to a uh, only 58% fuel, that's a 42% waste, and it's a sulfur waste, which is quite acid. But the number one acid food, some people call it a food, I don't, more a drug, is refined sugar. The number two on the list is meat. Also the hybridised wheat. The hybridisation of the wheat created a structure that has more of the acid minerals 
and if the wheat is grown with superphosphate, that brings the acidity up, and it's and it's uh, watered with chlorinated water, and it's um, it's sprayed with uh, glyphosate. glyphosate or Roundup. Well, oh, now we've got a very acid product. All drugs have an acid effect on the body because drugs really are chemicals. Aged cheese, what's the blue in the blue vein cheese? It's mould and mould is an acid, thrives in an acid environment. All caffeine foods and drinks have an acid effect. Alcohol is not a food but it creates an acid environment. Tobacco is not a food, but it creates an acid environment. All your other grains, other than the grains on the alkaline side, all your other legumes, other than lima, lentil and soy, and all your other nuts, other than almond and Brazil, have an acid effect. To maintain this 6.5 environment, we need to be consuming about 20 to 30 percent acid forming foods and that 20 to 30 percent acid forming food ideally should come from this section and we need to be having between 70 and 80 percent alkaline forming foods. That will maintain the 6.5 environment which is the environment the body runs very well at. What would most Americans be eating? 90? 90 acid? Yeah? 10 alkaline, if that. What's the hamburger gone on it? A lettuce leaf and a slice of tomato? That would hardly even make up the 10 cent. And picture in your minds the uh, carbohydrate list we've looked at a few times. That's almost 100% acid. Sugar cane is alkaline because it's got so many minerals in it. But the pure crystallised acid that's extracted from the sugarcane plant brings that over to the acid side. No wonder cancer and heart disease are neck to neck for number one killers in the world today. Mm. So you can do much to give your body the environment conducive for health and healing by starting to pursue other grains, by starting to eat more vegetables, more greens. That's an easy way to do it. Yes, rice is here. Yes, oats are here. Yes, walnuts are here. It doesn't mean they're out. We need a little acid. And as we looked at the carbohydrate list, carbohydrates aren't bad, it's only when they're overdone and refined. That's the problem. My husband would never forgive me if the potatoes stop. <laughs> but potatoes sit on the alkaline side. It's only when they're deep fried in three week old oil that can bring them to acid. So we had a lady attend our program who was in her 70s. Her, her joints were swollen. She had severe arthritis. She was in a lot of pain. And on the first two days of our retreat, and we looked at that when we looked at the liver, we serve fruit and vegetable juices. So most of our juices are 80% carrot, 10% apple, 10% celery, very alkalizing. So on the first two days of our retreat, everything we give our guests is alkalizing. Because everything, all waste that's coming out of the body is, has, is acid. By the end of the week, the pain in her joints had greatly eased. And what we were doing to bring relief in the aching joints was grated ginger. So grated ginger poultices. And as I mentioned yesterday, if you put a grated ginger poultice on an inflamed joint in a little poultice, it'll start to pull the, the inflammation out and the skin will get very hot. So if we're going to do a grated ginger poultice overnight on a 
sore hip or ankle or knee or fingers or wrist or elbow, we usually apply the poultice oh, about six o'clock in the evening. And then by the time they go to bed, maybe 8, 8.30, we say, how does it feel? And some people say, it's burning me, I can't handle it. Well, we'll just take it off because it's already pulled a lot of inflammation out. But some people say, oh, it feels so nice. Well, we leave it on all night. And that's usually enough. But when the person says, oh, it's so hot, it's burning me, I said, yeah, we'll take it off. Yeah, but how's the joint? And they go, actually, I can move my joint. Actually, the, the pain has gone from my joint. So the grated ginger root poultices are excellent for any joint inflammation. What we also did on other nights is castor oil compresses on the areas overnight. That penetrates deep, breaks up congestion. And she went home. And I did suggest to her that she, that she aim for a mostly alkaline diet. Yes, a little bit of rice is fine. Yeah, a little bit of oats sometimes fine. Yeah, a little bit of macadamia or, or uh, walnuts, fine. As long as most of her diet was on the alkaline side. She also chose to make herself a carrot, celery and apple juice, which she had twice a day. Doesn't take the place of water. So if you're going to have that, you have that maybe instead of an evening meal or maybe you'll have it half an hour before the meal. And she continued to do the ginger if, if her joints got painful. She said wearing the castor oil overnight was soothing. So she came back a year later. She said, I have conquered my arthritis. She's in her 70s. And she said, look at my joints. Her fingers had gone back to normal. Isn't that incredible? And that's almost unheard of, isn't it? But like the dripping tap on a stone is often how people get sick, little by little. And like the dripping tap on a stone, it's also how they get well. But the good news is if a person's not been well for 20 years, it won't take 20 years to get better. But it might take a year or two. This lady was so excited. She said, I'm in my 70s and I feel better than I felt in my 50s. We have people saying, we're going back to work. We thought we'd have to retire. Remember John, the verse in John, John 10.10, 10, easy to remember, John 10.10, 10, where Jesus said, I have come that they might have life and that they might have life more abundantly. In other words, that we should be enjoying life. So even arthritis can be conquered. And just before my mother died, she was 51, she went to a herb lady and the lady got her off all her medication and the lady got her, her pain free. Isn't that incredible? But unfortunately her body was so weakened by it, she passed in the night. But I watched my mother year after year have this medication and then they'd have to take her off that medication then she'd go through withdrawals and I just saw her body shrink up I saw her joints get more and more more and more inflamed and when I look at my mum as a child she was never in the sunshine because she had such light skin she never drank water she just drank cups of tea all day long she always had one or two sugars in the tea and she slept, but she had a lot of caffeine, and so she had a lot of headaches. And I think it's because she was dehydrated when I look back now. So every day, three or four times a day, she's taking, remember they used to have those headache powders? She'd take those headache powders. So this is in the early 60s. And every night, we always had Sausages or chops, mashed potatoes, frozen peas or beans. We never had dark green leafy vegetables. In the summer, we'd have a salad and it was the white heart of the iceberg lettuce. That's, that's the only time I had salad as a child. So the nutrition wasn't what it'd be. Mum never over ate. She was slim, but uh, she certainly overdid the caffeine and the headache tablets. She had a headache. And uh, I don't remember remember mum ever exercising. So I analyse and look, 
that my mum was creating an environment that was conducive to her getting arthritis. And then my dad made a move where we left our, my childhood home. He wanted to do another business in another town. And mum never wanted to do that, but she did it. And within three months of the move, she started to get pains. So there was an emotional aspect too. And at her funeral, my dad told me and my four siblings that. He'd noticed that, <laughs> that the pain started when the move happened. In every case of arthritis, there can be different factors coming in. And it's all of those different factors that create that environment. But isn't it good to know that it can be conquered? So before we close, are there any questions? And the film crew would like you to have a microphone. And if the microphone's not handy, I can just repeat your question. But I don't know how to work it. It's a press. Yeah? Um, oats, if you soak them overnight, do you rinse them again a couple times before you cook them? No, it's not necessary, but it's, pro it's best that you soak the oats in the fridge. In the fridge? Well, if, <laughs> if it's the middle of winter, Microphone's working. <laughs> so the, yeah, the oats, not in a hot environment because then you can get fermentation starting. So uh, ideally in a cool environment, maybe in your basement you'd soak the oats and then slowly cook it over the day. But my boys, my three boys, they love oats. They have oats for breakfast every day. They have no health problems. So, you know, that's why I leave the oats up to the person. But at our health retreat, we don't use oats because we have a lot of people come to us with compromised health, with health conditions. And I don't, I like the cooks to, to just cook things that everyone can cook. I don't like our cooks having to cook this for that person and this for that person. So I like to make life easier for our staffs. But if you love oats and they sit well with you and you have no health conditions, eat oats. <laughs> Yes? I was um, told about the Celtic salt, the real salt. You should worry that you have kidney stones. It might make you have more, be more prone to the kidney stones. Okay, so, th so you've heard that if you have the Celtic salt and you have kidney stones, you might be more likely to have kidney stones. Well, I don't believe that at all. That don't make any sense to me at all. If you have the table salt, you might be more prone to it, but it's going to a more alkaline diet. And that Celtic salt is a great alkalizer because it's very high in alkaline minerals. Yes? So, so two questions. You said lycopene is a, a potent antioxidant and something else for men? What the lycopene does is it reduces inflammation of the prostate gland. And the other part was the smoothie, the alkaline smoothie, 80% carrot, 10% apple, and 10% what? Celery. Celery. That's the juice that we do for our guests. Thank you. When you spoke of the um, ginger poultice for reducing inflammation, does that also help with nerve pain? Nerve pain, not as specifically, it's, it's a specific for inflammation. But sometimes when there's nerve pain, there is inflammation. If there's any inflammation, the ginger will reduce that inflammation. And is there anything that you recommend for nerve pain? Uh, you would try it and see. Okay. Because if there's nerve pain because of inflammation, it will relieve it. Okay. And if it's not because of inflammation? Well, you'll know when you do it. Okay. All right. <laughs> Thank you. So the, um, the patches that you do with ginger, how do you make them? Do you, oh, I just don't know, but I have a lady that needs Yeah, I'll, I'll show you. I did do it yesterday, but I recognize that there might be some here who weren't here yesterday. 
So with all poultices, I have a cloth about that size, and the cloth is best from your old sheets, your old dishcloths, thin cotton. It's the best. And you grate the ginger, and there's your ginger all in there like that. And if I'm going to do it, say, on, on a wrist, I would do about a teaspoon of ginger. And then I fold it over, I call it east, west, north and south, to make a package. So now we've got a package, and the package is probably about this big, which is a great one for my wrist. And you turn it over so all the folds are behind, and you can see it's starting to get quite wet with ginger juice and you apply it to the area and you put a piece of plastic behind it about that size then you would bandage it on with an ace bandage. When you, when you mentioned vinegar isn't good, would that apply to apple cider vinegar? When when I you said like vinegar is not Yes, good. all vinegar. Okay. Apple cider vinegar, we like use... Like Bragg's apple cider vinegar. We use topically. We only use vinegar topically. It's great for um, burning off warts or dissolving warts. It's great for, I hear, poison ivy because we don't have that. And apparently it's also very good for shingles. It's also very good if someone has tinea or athlete's foot. So we use vinegar topically. Um, my question was kind of similar to hers. Um, I had read that putting a tablespoon of apple cider vinegar in eight ounces of water first thing in the morning is good for detoxing the liver. Uh, would you recommend not to do it? or to? Yeah, I would not recommend that because lemon is far superior. Okay. And I have one more question. For someone who tore their ACL, um, what would you recommend for that person? Um, to apply to help heal that? Well, if they've torn it, it needs to be uh, immobilized so that it can't be moved because those tissues need to heal. But overnight, um, they could try comfrey one night, they could try um, castor oil another night and um, see what the body responds to. But there needs to be a period of time where it's kept still so that the tissues can, can mend together. Yes? Um, two things. Um, about eight years ago, I had problems with uh, kidneys, chronic kidney stones, and I switched to the Celtic salt, and I have not had kidney stones since. Yeah. So that's good. But my, part of my question is, um, about that same time, I quit sugar in my diet because of having asthma, and my asthma medicine is no longer. I don't need any of it. But all of us in this area, we have been dealing with the Canadian smoke coming over the border and all of our, our whole summer. If you go up high, you can see even the haze still. And it's created problems with my asthma. And I've been taking the activated charcoal, the chlorophyll water, the castor oil packs, which has helped. But I mean, even my horses are all coming in with runny eyes and yeah. congestion problems. So it's not just me. And I know everybody else has been breathing it in too. Is there something else that I can do to help support my lungs in, um, with these problems? Really uh, make sure you're only nose breathing. I wake up in the middle of the night all stuffed up, and so yeah. I've been mouth breathing, which is causing me to break out, yeah. which makes sense because you're talking about when you're mouth yeah. breathing, it's acidic. So I don't know what more I can do. And also in your house, you can get negative iron machines. I have ne two. Okay, because they purify the yeah. air. So you can do that, and you and doTERRA essential oils, Which and also um, Young Living. They're probably the two best. Yep. They have some essential oils that you can breathe in. I have okay. um, Young Living's um, cedar oil and spruce. Yeah. I also use the. Yeah, feeds. They, they all help a lot. You can even burn them in in those um, burners. Yeah. Yeah. So keep, just keep doing what yeah. I'm doing. Yeah. And let's hope the, um, it, I think it's tomorrow we're going to be talking about respiratory. I'll be talking about that in a bit more detail. I have a question about mullen. Is mullen falling more on the acid or alkaline side of the scale? My mom was recently diagnosed with lung cancer. Um, 
and I am going to attempt to introduce Mullen to her, but I don't know if I all, want to. If it's all, well, you could classify that as a dark green leafy herb. All your herbs are on the alkaline side. In what methods are best? Would it be tincture, capsules? In tea, any form. Or, or the smoke I hear is the best for the lungs, but I, I don't picture my mother being willing to breathe in mullein smoke. No, no, um, and I don't think breathing in mullein smoke is the best, but taking it in as a tea or a supplement. We don't grow mullein like it grows here, but I do know it is good on lungs. Yes, um, so my aunt uh, uh, had um, uh, cancer. Um, I think it was uterine cancer, I can't remember, but um, I remember, I think it was back to Eden, they were saying um, dark, uh, what is it? Uh, Dark berries, like blueberries, blackberries, raspberries, all those things are good for with, because of the antioxidants. So then, um, so obviously there's a balance in everything. So you're saying she should have come off of like all, you know, fruits like that and then introduced them afterwards That's right. it's, for the it's, antioxidants? It's only six weeks. Okay. And, you know, uh, tomatoes and beetroot, your dark coloured vegetables, also very high in antioxidants. Okay. But, um, yeah, just initially. Okay. Some down here. For someone that's struggling with yeast, besides going off of the fruits for six weeks, is there anything else that they can do? Well, in my book, The self Heal by Design, I've got the Cancer Conquering Diet, which is no fruit for six weeks. And then for people who want to conquer yeast, I've got the Antifungal Diet, Stage 1, and then the Antifungal Diet, Stage 2. And on the Antifungal Diet, Stage 1, um, they can have Granny Smith apples and grapefruit. And on the Antifungal Stage 2 diet, then they go over to the berries. The berries. Yeah. yeah. And at the same time, take herbs to kill the fungus. Um, which herbs would be best? Uh, grapefruit seed extract is good. I'm sorry, what was that? Grapefruit seed extract. You take about five drops three times a day. And then another one is olive leaf extract. It's usually a teaspoon three times a day. Another one is uh, portiaco. That's a South American herb that contains a a plant chemical called lapacho, which is strong antifungal. Um, another one is oregano essential oil, but you don't do all of those at once. You might two weeks on one, two weeks on another, two weeks on another. It's coming. <laughs> My son was just uh, diagnosed with a uh, as precancerous uh, mole, what would be a good way to start well, changing that? With, um, with skin cancer, there's one way to get rid of it real quick. There's one way to get rid of it reasonably quick. And there's another way to get rid of it a little bit slower. And you can buy a cream, it's called Cancema or Black Salve. And they tried to have it banned, but the judge threw it out. Uh, it's either called Cancema, and its active ingredient is uh, bloodroot. Sometimes they call it Cancema, sometimes black salve. You can even Google it, and um, it'll give you the recipe. You can even make it. And it's a black salve. And what you do is you put one small dot as big, you know, let's, let's say that the mole is this big. Let's say the mole is that big. Well, you only just cover that with the cancema and then you put a tape over it. Okay. And I, ideally a gentle tape, tape like a paper tape. And if it has cancer cells in it, it'll start to tingle and you leave it for 24 hours. After 24 hours, you take it off. And when you take it off, it'll be all red and raised and swollen and the middle be a little pussy. And over the next 24 hours, it can even look worse. Because at our retreat, we've applied it hundreds of times. 
And people say, Barbara, Barbara, look. And I say, fantastic. <laughs> Great reaction. How does someone look after the day or the, the, when they wake up from having a nose job? Black. So you see, don't worry about it looking bad. It's halfway through its operation. And then usually after another 24 hours, it starts to shrink. It starts to get a, a, like a scab in the middle. And usually after 10 days, the core falls out. That's the cancer. Then you're left with a crater. And usually over the next few weeks, the crater just fills up and you're left with a little scar. So that's how you can quickly get rid of a skin cancer. You're only applying this the one time? Once. Okay. Once. If it looks like there might still be something there, you apply it again maybe two months later when it's totally healed. So that's the quick way. The so if you're not taking it on and off for 10 days and reapplying? No, no, once. 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 Just once. It can get too inflamed if you... Uh, once is enough. It's like going back and having your no, nose job done every couple of days. You just do it once, just <laughs> once. Okay, now the second quick, well this one's not as quick, this might take a month, and that's putting one drop of oregano oil. You call it oregano, yeah? Every day, once a day, and it'll sting, <laughs> and it'll eat it out. Uh, you might have to do it once a day for even three weeks, but it, it will eat it out. So that's the second quickest way. The slowest way is to apply castor oil to it twice a day. And that might take a couple of months. Yes? There's a, oh, sorry, we'll do this one first. Um, you had mentioned the swollen legs, and that was the indication of kidney function. Well, it can be. It can be, okay. What, what would you do? Uh, if someone had swollen legs, that swe swelling, it can be a few things, and one can be kidney. But if they get on the rebounder, one minute every hour, just do this. This is called the health bounce, and that helps to, because it's lymphatic fluid. And also, when someone has swollen legs or ankles, the doctor gives them a diuretic, and that as a drug can have a side effect, but there is a natural diuretic called dandelion. And I've had people tell me that the dandelion is more effective than the drug. And ideally get that in a tablet form, capsule, and take that three times a day. Three times a day? Yeah. Well, it depends on the dosage. You know, if you get a high dose, you maybe only need to take it twice a day. But dandelion's very safe herb, very safe. Hi there. Uh, so I have a question. I'm seeing that people are advertising little devices, machines to alkalize water. And I'm wondering if you feel like, I understand all of what you're telling us and that's fabulous. I'm wondering if using alkalized water would speed recovery of health do you know, it can, and if someone's got an alkaline water machine, I say, great, use it, but I don't think I'd spend the money because, as you can see by what I've shown you, this is the best way to do it. And if you drink alkaline water at a mealtime, that'll really kill off, <laughs> neutralise your stomach acid. So it's the greens that, that are more alkalised, the tissues. And as you can see by what you've looked at today, that's what we want to alkalise and implementing the laws of health. One lady rang me and she said, Barbara, as a family, we like a bit of junk food, so we've bought an alkaline water machine and we think that'll help a bit. Like French fries and junk food. Yeah. <laughs> French fries and a green drink. <laughs> No, if you drink with your meals, you will neutralise your stomach acid. Okay. But if you sit to your meal well hydrated, you will not need to drink. Okay. So ideally you stop half an hour before the meal and you resume about an hour and a half to two hours after the meal, ideally. Yes, yeah. I have a question about the castor oil. 
Is there a certain brand that you recommend? Um, some people say it should be in a glass bottle, but I looked at a study done recently in the plastic bottle, it does not absorb. See, what castor oil does when you apply it to you, it doesn't absorb, it penetrates. And wherever it penetrates, it breaks up the unnatural formations. Um, so they don't spray castor oil plants, they're just like a wild weed. Um, I guess you get the best you can. I, I'm not familiar with um, American brands. I'm not even familiar with Australian ones because I don't do any of the ordering. I appreciate your YouTube video that helped me to understand about that. I've been applying it to the goiter. Yeah, yeah. So is That's there any good. other suggestions you yeah, may the have? Yeah, the castor oil is very good and you would have heard us talk about the thyroid when we first started. Uh, the Lugal solution, applying the Lugal solution to test your iodine okay. levels. Lugal solution. L U G O L S. Lugal. Okay. Lugal I, I have solution. never heard of that. And also um, balancing the hormones with the yam creams. Okay. Because high estrogen is what opposes thyroid function. Okay. And Celtic salt, I didn't hear the amount that. That you suggested. Well, a crystal about the size of a sesame seed before each glass of water and then put it on your food to your taste. Okay. That's the best. Do you have books for sale here? No. But okay. if you go to Misty Mountain USA and hurry because Emma hasn't got many books left. She's got we've got thirty thousand that are coming in late August. Okay. But she's, she told me she's still got a couple of boxes, but they'll be gone in a week. So Misty Mountain USA sells my book, Self Heal by Design. Bone spurs, can you get rid of them? Pardon? Bone spurs, can you get rid of them? Students, bone spurs. Castor oil. Castor oil. <laughs> um, my question is if you have any suggestions for carpal tunnel. Carpal tunnel, bone spurs. So, where'd that come from? Castor oil. Castor oil, and you just put it on every night, every night, every night. But you've also got to look at what you usually do. When people are at computers all day long, the, the, body, the hands are gonna, and the wrists are gonna start protesting. Um, if you cook the peppers, potatoes, and eggplants like you did the tomatoes with the oil, and take no, the skin, you it's a different process, yeah. Different process. You said gout is from an allergy to gluten and dairy? Well, gout is very similar to arthritis and it thrives in an acid environment. So all, your, all these foods here are conducive to, you know, creating an environment in the body where, where gout can can manifest itself, but your uh, ginger, ginger poultices are very good at reducing the pain of gout. At Misty Mountain, have you had patients who've been diagnosed with dementia? Yes. If anyone with dementia comes, they need to have a carer. A carer, because we don't have the, we're not a hospital, we don't have the facilities to have full-time care. But the book Stop Alzheimer's Now, by Dr. Bruce Fife. There are several stories in there of turning uh, Alzheimer's and dementia around by using coconut oil. That's the good news. Hi, good morning. Um, so I came, I came from a long line of diabetics and I, when I researched apple cider vinegar, two tablespoons, it did help my blood sugar from going. I'm not diagnosed yet. I'm thinking I'm pre, but if I use lemon, will it do the same thing in like keeping my blood well, sugar? Well, the main, the main thing that influences blood glucose levels is the food we eat. I'm, I'm doing low carb, I'm not yeah. doing sugars, yeah. um, even my fruits are very... And remember that genetics loads the gun, but lifestyle pulls the trigger. So even, it's like my mother, she died at 51, a total cripple in a wheelchair. So. I have the choice whether I go there or not there, and, but many people go there because they don't know how to stop it. So it's the same with diabetes. We've seen type 1, type 2 diabetics totally recover. 
totally recover and it's implementing these simple laws of health. Um, and, you know, that's how we do it with, with, with food. Okay. Yeah, no, I'm not doing any more sugars, uh, even my fruits. Um, I'm doing, um, what is that, what is that? Uh, I'm not, well, I used to eat rice three times a day. That was one of my biggest things that I had to like cut and I, I no longer do that. Um, I also do, there's a bitter gourd tea that my dad used to take. It did lower his um, blood sugar, but I'm a little concerned because the pith in the middle of it, it's a Southeast Asian fruit, the pith in the middle will cause um, a, a miscarriage. I'm not pregnant, but I'm just, uh, I'm just wondering if you're familiar with it, is it okay to keep going? Well, we, we see incredible turnarounds just by changing diet and lifestyle. That's the good news. We're keeping John fit today. <laughs> uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to know if you know uh, what the symptoms of uh, an uh, oxalic acid, oxalic acid, or oxalates, where where you can't eat so much of it and it, and it has an adverse reaction because we're we're trying to uh, we're reading about alternative uh, plants to eat besides just the generic uh, uh, vegetables and one is uh, a sheep sorrel and uh, uh, it's delicious for your salad it's just, it's just wonderful but well, it's, it's high in it's interesting salads. it's interesting with uh, your greens like you have collard greens we don't have them, but we have spinach and silver beet, we have kale. So all of these greens are reported to have oxalic acid in them. Now in its raw state, it's in an organic form and so it remains alkaline, but when it's cooked, it becomes inorganic oxalic acid and that's more where a problem would arise when people who are prone to reacting to oxalic acid. So you can eat it raw every day, but if you have it cooked, maybe once a week. Okay, that's great. I have one more question. Uh, uh, when I eat, I know I love peppers. <laughs> I love peppers. Well, do you know if you love peppers and you don't have gout or arthritis, eat peppers. <laughs> oh, well, I don't, I don't have either, but uh, every time I, I, uh, I have, not so much when I eat like a bell pepper or you know cayenne pepper or jalapeno, whatever, but when I use black pepper, I sneeze, and it's not just once or twice, it's like a minimum of 15 to 20 times. Yeah, what's your body saying? Yeah, I know. <laughs> so it's, I time, it's time to, to, <laughs> to buy a papaya or pawpaw and gather the seeds and dry them out and use them. You mentioned um, that either under-exercising or over-exercising can cause an acid environment. Um, what would you consider over-exercising? Oh, probably 10 hours a day. Well. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was not able to be here yesterday for work, but I wanted to ask you about snoring because you talk about sleeping. What did you do with people that snores? Um, get the acid, get the um, mucus foods out of the diet, which is dairy, wheat, oats, peanuts, refined sugar, and start taping the mouth up at night. Just a little bit of tape over there. And what, and what the person does is they just tape their mouth up for an hour a day for a week, and their brain gets used to that tape there, and then and then sleep all night. In the book Breath by James Nestor, here. Breath. 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 One chapter's called Inhale, one chapter's called Exhale, one chapter's called Chew. I interesting book. I know I asked this yesterday, but I need somebody else to hear it. So blood thinners for blood clots? Well, 
the best blood thinner is not rat poison, I mean wolfrin. And that's what it is, it's a rat poison. It causes the rats to bleed to death. They don't give as much to, ah, sorry, I felt a bug there. They don't give as much to humans, of course, but often humans can start to, to bleed. I feel like I've got an ant biting me. They start to bleed, their noses bleed, they just brush their skin and they, they bruise. But there is an alternative and that's cayenne pepper. Cayenne pepper thins the blood. Cayenne pepper, I feel like something's biting me. Cayenne pepper thins the blood. Cayenne pepper um, strengthens the arterial wall. Cayenne pepper opens the blood vessels. There's no need for drugs as painkillers. You can take cayenne pepper. Or blood clots. Yeah, blood clots. There's no drug that'll break up a blood clot. All it does is thin the blood. 